Bowers welcoming you to Dialogue here at E-Plus TV 6 and an opportunity to talk with writer Robert Broughton. He is from Cleveland, Tennessee, a background in psychology, and we'll find out how he got connected with the State Line Mob. But he wrote a book called The Ghost Tales of the State Line Mob, very extensive, well-documented book, and has followed that up with a volume about Sheriff Buford Pusser in McNary County. It's good to have you with us. Good to be here. All right, so your background is in psychology. You teach psychology. I teach psychology. Okay, so what got you interested in, in all of this? Well, in my classes, I have uh, part of the course where I have the students go back and look at uh, mental illness in their family tree. Okay. And one of my students, she was doing the project. This is a whole semester project. And she comes to me and said, Mr. Broughton, there's something wrong. I said, what is wrong? She says, I've come across people, they cannot be related to me. And I said, okay. I said, well, who are they? And they said, their name are Hathcocks. Okay. And she says, I don't know who these people are. My dad said he vaguely knows of them. And I said, well, can I look into this a little deeper? So okay. I started researching it. And I found the state line. Okay. And after I found the state line, I got fascinated. And I said, do you care if I go and dig in this more? She says, have at it. So <laughs> there, there's the... So you start throwing the family tree leaves in. Yes. Okay, for, for her. Uh, okay. How far back do you take this? All the way back into Phoenix City, Alabama? Or we go, where, where, we where go back start? to uh, Reconstruction, okay. Civil War. All right. So I start with the great-great-grandfather who moved out of Georgia to Smithville, Mississippi. Okay. And then they have a baby. That's William Peyton Hathcock. Okay. They moved from Smithville that year to okay. Mickey, Tennessee. Okay. And they get a 40-acre farm to Homestead, and that's where it all starts. So it starts there, okay. They tied in because the stuff that came into Corinth and the state line, all this stuff, came. some of that came out of Phoenix City, Alabama. So what is the story of what has now we now refer to as the state line mob? And I think W.R. Marsh wrote a lot about that, and you followed some of his work. Correct. Yeah. Uh, the state line mob is not really a mob, but it's just a group of families who got on there who were trying to make a living any way they could and bootleg liquor and gambling was a fast cash, easy money. The law was loose back then on that state line. Okay. Uh, you could give some money to a deputy or sheriff and they'd look the other way, and, and it was a booming business from the 30s to the 50s. Okay. Um, Why did it settle in that area between Corinth and, and Selma? Well, Phoenix City got busted by uh, General Patton. Okay. He pushed them out, yeah. and a lot of these people were from Corinth in the beginning, okay. and they just moved back. Okay. So, so they had been down there then. They had been and, down and, there. Involved with that. John Patterson, his son, eventually became governor of, of Alabama prior to, to George Wallace, and so it was a long family history. In fact, uh, he, Patterson was murdered down there, right? Right. In, in, in Phoenix City, Alabama. So these people, it's a common, the families are already there. They're already they're, there. They're scratching like a lot of people to make a living. Correct. And, and as it, we had relatives up in East Tennessee and all that in North Georgia and North Alabama right. doing the same thing. Okay. So it started then in the 30s. How did it start? Well, William Payton uh, was making moonshine. And, uh, of course, you know, you got prohibition issues were come, that he okay. had to deal with. Okay. And then you got the Depression. And he had started a store because he could not get sugar and mash. Okay. So he started a store in Corinth, right across from Nelson Tim Lake's bar. And um, so Nelson Tim Lake and WP got to be real good friends. Well, Nelson Tim Lake owned uh, the rustic inn that he had just built up near the state line. Okay. He had another little building there on the state line. He tore it down and he built the state line club. So he had those three businesses going. WP was supplying him with moonshine. Okay. And then after World War I, uh, those two got together and they, they started bringing bootleg whiskey down out of Canada. Okay. After World War I or two? At, after World War I. One, okay. So they go back early. They go way back. Okay. So in 1934, there's the big shootout with WP and his son Isdu in Corneth and down on the main streets of Corneth. Okay. They what had, prompted it? Uh, 
as do beat his dad up for hitting his mom. And right. so WP it's a went, family thing. Then. It's a family thing. And this was on Mother's Day. <laughs> so on Mother's Day, he comes out and shoots, has a gunfight with his son in the street at the general store they owned. And uh, Isdu actually staggers and falls dead in Tim Lake's bar. And uh, WP, well, excuse me, I got this wrong. WP dies there on the spot. Oh, okay. And Isdu is taken to the hospital and dies the next morning. Okay, so they both die. They both die. Okay, as a result of this. All right. So where do we get then this 30s transition as we head toward we're going to head toward Buford Puster in the 1960s. Right. So Jack Hathcock, he's the baby boy. Baby boy, okay. Of the family. And he will then, um, he had been bootlegging for his daddy since he was 12, and he's 14 now at the time of this shooting. He gets in trouble, ends up going to Nashville to the boys' reform school. He spends several months there. Nelson Timlake gets him out and brings him back to Corinth. And Nelson takes, takes him under his wing, teaches him everything up on the state line. Um, the thing about Jack, even though he was slow in, in many accounts from what people said, he's very smart. He, he didn't spend his money. He was very careful how he spent his money. And he had saved every nickel he had since he was 12 years old until he was 19. He had $30,000. That was a lot of a lot money, money back in the day. Okay. And when World War II started, um, Nelson says, I need a partner. I've got to get a partner. And Jack says, well, let me run it. And he says, no, I want a partner. And so Jack says, I got money. Nelson kind of laughed because there's a 19-year-old says he's got money. You know, most of everybody there was no shoes and mm -hmm. raggedy clothes. And Jack comes back with the money and puts it down on the table. And he starts... Partnership, partnership with Nelson okay. Timlake. Okay. So then, that would have been what year then? That would have been 1938, 39. Okay. All right, so late 30s. Okay. All right. Robert Broughton is with us. Uh, his his first book was Ghost Tales. The uh, first book that we're talking about, Ghost Tales of the State Line Mob. He has followed it up with a volume on Sheriff Buford Pusser. A lot of photographs, a lot of documentation in, in this research, and we'll continue this discussion. This is dialogue. Robert Broughton is our guest here at E Plus TV Six. Back to dialogue here at E Plus TV 6 in a conversation with Robert Broughton. He is with us. His work is called Ghost Tales of the State Line Mob, and he's followed that up with a volume on Buford Pusser. And so we're good, good to have him with us. We've gotten to the late 1930s with the Hathcock family. They're in Mississippi. They're already in business. They're, They're in business, business in some ways on the state line as well. Jack falls in love with Louise Anderson. Okay. And Louise was working for Nelson, and it was a quick romance. Nine months, they're married. By 1940, um, Jack buys out Nelson. He buys out the state line. He now, at 20 years old, is the owner of a, a club. And so as Jack is trying to keep the club going, Louise is trying to find interest elsewhere. And she took off on Jack with an army um, soldier and okay. went to Missouri. Okay. Jack goes to Missouri to get Louise. Okay. So well, she left him. She left him. Okay. But she, so he takes George North. They go there to get Louise. They kidnap her to bring her back to Corinth. Well, they didn't get very far. Louise jumps out of the car, ends up in a ditch. Jack takes her to the hospital. She's got broken ribs, all beat up. The sheriff comes in, starts asking questions. Jack gets scared, and they take off. So they get to Memphis and they get arrested. And so the sheriff has them brought back over to Missouri and uh, Nelson Timlake comes and pays the bill. Nelson had a club in, in that little town there in Blytheville. Okay, Blytheville, Arkansas? Yeah. Okay. That was where the little army camp was. Okay. He had the rustic in there too. Okay. So he was good friends with the sheriff. And uh, magically, everything disappears. Okay. 
Nelson gives the sheriff $300, tells him to buy a steak, and he takes Louise and George and Jack back home. Okay. And um, so then, by 1945, the state line club gets burnt down. Okay. And um, on purpose, by accident. It was by no, no. accident. Okay. okay. Uh, it's probably grease fire, okay. you know, the old electrical. And the earth, they could have burned it down. Okay. Who knows? But the odds are, it, from what I could tell, newspaper accounts, yeah, it was okay. just a grease fire in the fire. kitchen. Okay. Okay. And then so they built a new club called the 45 Grill. Okay. So it's sitting there where the old state line is. Okay. And that rock and roll pretty big. They okay. were making money. It was not unusual for them to bring in two or three thousand dollars a weekend. Okay. That was lots of money back then. Gambling, liquor, all of it? Gambling, or? liquor, prostitution. Okay. You Hold just it. name your that, vice, they okay. had it they there for it. you. Okay. And this is uh, right between Corinth and, and, and Selma right there? Right on the state, state line. line. Yeah. On the Mississippi side or Tennessee side? Right down the middle. Right down the middle. We're going both ways. They actually okay. had a line in the floor. So it's thriving then as you move into the 1950s. Yeah, it's thriving. Okay. But Louise is not so much in love with Jack. They've already adopted a daughter. Her name is Susan. Okay. They adopted her in 1948. Um... And Jack and Louise put everything they have in her name. Okay. They actually go to court and get her a guardian so they could put all their assets in her name. Okay. So 1957 rolls by, and Louise has already shot Jack twice by now. Okay. And 1957 rolls by, and Louise gets her a new boyfriend named Pee Wee Walker. Okay. And Pee Wee was uh, another Elvis Presley looking type guy, curly hair, handsome young man. Um, and they would sneak off, they'd go to Biloxi and have, a, have some weekend meetings and that. And the problem was, was he worked for Jack. And uh, Jack kind of figured something was wrong okay. because she was gone, he was gone no, at the same time. Okay. The same time so, so we're headed toward a collision. <laughs> um, when Jack figured it out, he had him killed, and uh, he, he hired four thugs to take care of him, and um, they did it well, and they dumped his body over in Corinth, and um, the family of Pee Wee Walkers, they actually shot their house up and told them to get out of town. Okay. Jack was that mad. Okay. All right. Were they the only family operating on the state line, or oh, were there no. others? No, you had uh, you had Hard Hard Bunch. Okay. He had several clubs going on at okay. the same time. All in that same area. All in the same area. He was in partnership with uh, W. L. Hathcock. Okay. At the Plantation so there other, Club. There are the Hathcocks involved. Right. In this. So the Plantation okay. Club was built in 1953 by W. O. Okay. W. O. Was uh, not. Jack's favorite nephew. Okay. W.O. wanted everything right now where Jack had been working for it all these years and he was trying to push his uncle out. Okay. Uh, you had Kings that had some stuff going on. You had Hopkins had things going on down there. Um, so there, there were several families. How did they divide that up, or did was there just tension, or it just... was just like they did moonshine? Okay. It was battles. It was battles. Okay, they're, so they're, they're competitors. They were competitors. Okay. Uh, Ed George was one who had a nightclub down there, and he was murdered. Okay. Uh, he was shot in the forty-five club going through the door because they burned his club down, and he was going to ask questions, and they just shot him on the spot okay. with a shotgun. The ability to do this, to operate openly, we had other places, we had other clubs and other locations in Tennessee and Mississippi and everything else, but this is obviously pretty large scale for our area. It's large scale. Okay, so what made that, what made that possible then? It so you a, had to pay off law on both sides of the, the line. You had to pay off law. It, you know, a lot of people don't understand how the sheriff's department worked back then. The sheriff's departments did not have a budget. Most counties did not have a budget for their sheriff's department. So what they could take in from confiscating gambling stuff, confiscating bootleg liquor, and that stuff, they got to keep. They got to sell it off and keep the money to keep running. Well, unfortunately, you had some sheriffs who did that, and they, they let the little guys do their business, and they get the money from them, and they shut the big guys down. Okay. 
Well, some of the big guys, they had a lot of money, and some of the sheriffs would say, well, you know. Could you do it all locally, or did you have to go above that? Do you have to go to the state houses, or, you know, I mean, how far does this payoff system go? This payoff system goes all the way up to the governor's office. Okay, okay. In most cases. Okay. I mean, because you've you got to work through DAs. And, yeah, there, I mean, it, there's, they're it's multifaceted. Just, it's okay. multifaceted. So, so we, we got all that. When does Buford Pusser get introduced to all this? Buford Pusser gets introduced on January 1956, January 22nd, 1956. Okay. Buford goes, him and his, his high school buddies goes to what was at the time Jack's House of Suds. Jack had several clubs. Okay. And Jack's House of Suds was right up from the 45 Grill. So they go up there, and they're in there having a good time. These you know, teenagers are drinking their beer, watching the girls dance, and all of a sudden the fight breaks out over there in the corner, and it's a Navy man waiting on someone. He's a, he's a pilot. Okay. He's going to pick up a friend, take him on up to the air base. Well, they kept trying to get him to gamble. He wouldn't, and Toehead White would not stop and and got mad and started fighting with him, started beating him up, and Louise got in the middle of the fight, and she's hitting him with a hammer, and they worked the poor boy over. Sheriff Billy Joe Kirby ends up coming in, and when Sheriff Billy Joe shows up, Buford and them boys head out the door and scared to death. That's Sheriff from McNary County? From McNary County. Hang, I, on to, hang on to that thought, because I'm going to take this break. We'll be right back. Okay. Robert Broughton is with us. We're at the state line in the 1950s. This is Dialogue at E Plus TV 6. Welcome back to Dialogue at E Plus TV 6. We're talking with Robert Broughton. He's a writer. The Ghost Tales of the State Line Mob, one book, and uh, Sarah Bu Buford Pusser, a follow-up volume to that. A lot of photos, a lot of documentation in, in this work. we got Buford Pusser at the State Line in 1956. He's there as a customer, young man, yes. whatever. And so young this man. fight is going on. The sheriff comes in. They're going to leave, and what happens to that? Well, they get out the door. And uh, so the sailor is taken to the hospital, ends up in Memphis, uh, the commander of the air base is want, wanting answers because okay. this is one of his pilots. Oh, okay. And so they ended up getting in the middle of it with okay. uh, Sheriff Billy Joe. And I went and talked to Sheriff Billy Joe yeah. not long before he died. Okay. And sh he said that he was trying to, you know, keep the sailor out of trouble so he didn't write a report about it. Because okay. he thought the sailor was in there drinking, might have started the fight, and right. he was just trying to help him out. Well, that wasn't the case. The sailor never drank. He mm -hmm. had no blood, in his, no alcohol in his blood at the time they took him to the hospital. Okay. And they said, we want something done. So they ended up arrest, arresting Towhead White okay. for the beating. And Towhead spent eight months in jail for it and had a big fine to pay. Of course, Louise Hathcock paid all that. And, okay. Um, so then we get on into summer, early summer, and Buford decides he's going back down, but he's not going to stop at the House of Suds. He's going to go down to Plantation. That seems okay. like to be a little better, and he heard the girls were prettier. Okay. And Buford liked girls. Okay. So Buford goes down to the, house, to the Plantation, and he uh, had $300 in his pocket because he was working the pipelines. And um, this is 1950 $300. Yeah. So. yeah, but he, he wasn't all one paycheck. Okay, he'd yeah. been saving it up to go yeah. down there. Down there. That's what I'm he, saying. He, he, he walked in with some money. Yeah, he was going to double his money. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, Buford kind of got a little mouthy. Buford was well known for being a little bit of a bully around with mm -hmm. other people, with kids and stuff. And he wasn't afraid to use that massive size he had. And, so he started mouthing off with them down there at the plantation club, and, and they cleaned his clock. They worked him over. All right. So they threw him out the back door, and... Um, you say worked him well, they beat him pretty badly. Then. They beat him bad, they cut him up, okay. and I heard 92 stitches later. Okay. Um, Dr. Phillips sewed him up. He was an Army surgeon, and uh, Dr. Humphrey, who was in partners with him, his wife, who's still alive, uh, she was there to help with the 
care of Buford that, that night he was brought in. Okay. She was the nurse. When he comes back and he's elected sheriff, does, he, does that end his involvement down there? Does he stay after them and, and, and just become a vendetta? Because he goes north and wrestles and does other things, right? Well, he goes, you know, after that, he goes to Chicago, Chicago for two years, okay. and he gets married, and he comes back. Okay. And um, his dad had a wreck, was hurt, says, you need to be constable. I can't do the job. It's too much for me. So they arrange for him to take over constable. as constable. Okay. So he does constable for two years. His dad says, well, you need to be sheriff. So they go and do some raids. They did a couple illegally. Judge throws them out. That's probably one of the things they involved. They were doing it for publicity? They were doing it for publicity okay. to be run for sheriff. Okay. Um, law and order, man. Law and order. James okay. Dickey is in here. James was good friends with Buford. You know, there's a lot of stories that they were enemies. It's not true. They, okay. were, they were good friends, good friends of the families. And uh, so James actually was wanting to hire Buford as a deputy. And Buford says, well, I'm going to run for sheriff. And James says, in his mind, good luck, because he knew he had that job locked okay. in. And, uh, but he says, if not, I want you as a deputy. So that was okay. the camaraderie between those two. So all the stuff we see in the movies is fiction. Yeah. yeah okay. All this Pretty much. All right. What did you learn about this that we need to know? Because we kind of pick up the Buford Puster story around here, you know, once he's famous and, and he does telethons and all this other thing, the movies and everything else come out. And, and do you get into all of that in, in, in your I, work? I don't dig into that okay. as much as I try to keep just the sheriff, the sheriff part. part. Okay, and, 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 yeah. and, and get through this. What did you learn about this that we need to know? About well, him? the thing... Because we got this myth, yeah. legend yeah. thing out here. When, we got a, a, Well, a, a, when James Dickey was got killed. He got killed a day before the election in a car wreck. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a wreck down on Highway 22 and uh, Officer McCannahan and uh, James Dickey and Buford and a couple of other constables okay. showed up to help. It was a bad wreck. Well, when they all left, they all went different ways, but McClanahan was behind James about a minute or two behind him, and he was flying, and the front tire blew out, and he crashed. Okay. And that's in the book. The car wreck's okay. in the book. And But people accused Buford of killing James. Okay. And that's when these stories started. Okay. Before he was even he elected. elected. Okay. These, Did these, he win the election straight up? He won the election straight up. Okay. By, not by much, but he won it. Okay. Um, uh, James would have won it if he was alive, okay. hands down. Okay. He was by far. So that wreck changed things. Changed but then, things. But then the, the stories are. So what, what is the difference between the myth as we know it and the man, then, as, as, as far as you, you find out about it? Buford was, first of all, too young for the job. He was very immature. He was not a seasoned officer. Okay. He did not have the experience it took. So he ran on brute force and the power of his fist. Okay. If someone did not do what he wanted, he made them wish they had done what he wanted. Okay. And that's just how he ran it. He, he was rough on them down there on the state line. He, he, they called him a thug. Okay. They thought he was worse than they were. Okay. You know, uh, what was his motive, as far as you've been able to determine? Part of it was that he really did want to clean up the state line. Okay. But a whole lot of it was getting even. Okay. So it's a mix. It was a mix. Mix in there, okay. And the effects we know of. The circumstance of his wife's death, who planned that assassination? That assassination was planned by Howard Bunch and W.O. Hathcock. Yeah. It all goes back to, to them, all the investigations, the FBI, the TBI, they all, all, everything they found, it went back to them, but they couldn't tie the knot. Mm -hmm. They had all the leads went right back to that motel. The phone call came from the motel for him to go down there. Uh, the gun was purchased by Hard Bunch. The gun, they tore Corinth up trying to find that gun after okay. the shooting, but they were always a day behind. The daughter of Bobby Floyd, who was driving the car, said, seen the gun. They knew where the gun was. They hid it under houses. They, you know, they kept the gun moving. 
I want to think it's a different day and time, and I think in many ways it is, you know, because gambling has become a legal thing. I and mean, all the things that were vices right. then, we've now legalized, and right. which has changed the environment of all this. I think it's difficult for people to understand the context of those times. It is Wild West. It is Wild way. West. It is very much Wild West. Appreciate the time talking talk to you. Buford Pusser, Sheriff Buford Pusser, picks up the story or focuses on him from the state line model. So right. these are kind of conjoined works out there. Yeah, the, each story is the families, and you'll, you'll get a good look at in depth of the families and how they were thinking and how they massed uh, lots of money. Louise Hathcock had $8,000 around her neck the day she was shot. That's more than most people made in two years back then. Yeah, it's a different day and time. It's good to see you. Robert Broughton with us, and how do you get this work? Amazon.com. Okay. It's B R O U G H T O N. B R O U G H T O N. Ghost Tales of the State Line Mob and Sheriff Buford Pusser. A real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Stay with us here at E Plus TV 6 because this is the place where the dialogue continues. <laughs>